you try to explain it to them, and they say, well, I don't see it that way. And so you go back to your office and stare at it, and think, well, maybe I should write it better. And maybe I screwed up. Maybe I, it actually doesn't read the way that I think it does. There's not a page in Prop 204 that doesn't have issues like that. And that's just not for me. This is from Joint Legislative Budget Committee that's tried to analyze it, Department of Education that's tried to analyze it. Uh, just one quick example before I tell you how why we don't like it. This will, this will uh, provide in the school finance formula that if the, if the mine shuts down in Ajo, the Freeport Macron leaves Ajo, and Ajo school district goes from 500 kids to 100, that we put the same amount of money into Ajo Unified that we're putting in there now. Now who thinks that's a, that's a good idea? We have a student-based run system. Schools get money based upon what their students, money follows the kids from, but they wrote it to give them a guarantee that they get the, the as a base foundational amount, a guarantee that they never get less than what they were receiving in this fiscal year. That's insane. Now they will say, they, they're embarrassed by it that they wrote it that way and say, well, no, it doesn't read that way. Well, actually it reads that way and everybody that is familiar with that section of Title 15 no, knows that it reads that way. Uh, we're opposed to it uh, fundamentally and have always. We, we have quite a track record opposing what we call ballot box budgeting, where, sit, where special interest groups use the initiative process to run off with money. Outside of the outside of the budgeting process, uh, the state we've been we've opposed so with some success and failed in some instances uh, for decades. We think the singular most important responsibility of the legislature when they meet is to do the budget. They, in fact, they could meet and do nothing else, and they and we would be okay. But they have to they have to pass a state budget when through the, the initiative process you ever so slowly put stronger and stronger handcuffs on their ability to be able to change priorities over time, you, we have, we have uh, decimated that budgeting process. At the, at the bottom of the Great Recession, there isn't anybody at the Capitol that would have debated that all of the things that we had done through initiatives to tie the legislature's hands were probably a bad idea that put us in a very, very difficult spot to be able to meet changing demands when we lost 40% of our revenue. It's odd that right on the brink of coming out of this, here's another initiative that is going to permanently raise the state sales tax, but permanently earmark, and I, should, I don't know if I was going to do this, I have some charts in, in the car, but on our website, on if you go on there, there's info on 117 and 204, and in the 204 section, go in there and open up, we've got a color chart. They don't have this color chart because they don't want you to see how this works, by the way. We created it. that shows you the 11, 11 new earmarks created by this. Looks like 28. There's only 11 brand new ones. And every one of those earmarks is permanent. Can never be, never be changed. Legislature can never look over the fence and say, now exactly how is this money being spent? It is forever. Uh, outside the appropriations process and locked up. It's not how we would recommend using uh, a permanent sales tax increase. And for example, the most pressing need that we have in school finance in Arizona right now is, cap is capital related. We've got a challenge with funding our capital programs. There's been no money to fund what we call the school facilities board for obvious reasons. Schools are at their debt limits and can't sell bonds. It would be handy to have a couple hundred million bucks to put in the school facilities board to rifle shop money to Higley Unified, for instance, that um, has has needs out there. They they wrote this and didn't provide one penny for what most people would think is top on the list in terms of needs at the at the K-12 level. The second thing that uh, that really concerns us a lot about this is that there's a provision in the initiative that essentially freezes the state sales tax base, the legislature will be prohibited from making changes to the base that this rate applies to. Um, I won't walk you just to torture um, all my city friends. Walk, won't walk you through what our sales tax looks like. But we have a very complicated sales tax code because we have an independent municipal code. Uh, Governor Brewer's put together a task force to try to simplify this. We think our system needs to be simplified because 
We rely most heavily on the sales tax in Arizona. We have very high rates, second highest rate overall rates in the country. We greatly incentivize Arizonans to evade that tax. <coughs> it's, it's not a real smart tax system to say we're going to rely heaviest on the sales tax. We're going to have some of the highest rates in the country. And by the way, we kind of know that no one really has to pay this unless they want to just buy groceries at the store. You have ready access to evade paying that tax with online uh, purchases. It is a huge problem for us in Arizona. We don't think the internet ought to be a tax-free zone. It's not fair to Main Street businesses. We would like to, looking forward, to be able to affiliate with the streamlined sales tax movement so we are in a position as a state, as most other states that are thinking are doing, to try to be able to finally solve taxing remote sales. Oregon, one of the gentlemen at the beginning was from here, or Oregon doesn't care. Oregon doesn't have a sales tax. The taxation of the internet doesn't matter to them one iota. They get all their money out of property and income. We care. We've built this system that says we're going to rely really heavily on the sales tax. So we need it. We better protect it. And if we want to sustain it, we've got to clean up our, our sales tax code to be able to affiliate. We can't. We're so far from that. The legislature is going to have to act to fix that. If this passes, if 204 passes, the day after it passes, everybody involved in the governor's task force isn't showing up again. There's nothing we can do to fix our state and local sales tax code if some genius is put, essentially put in the Constitution that the legislature can't change the sales tax base at all. When I asked them why they, why they did that, the first, the proponents that really, the, the, I got a blank look. I don't think that they thought that gave two seconds thought to the damage that they were doing to uh, what is a huge cause to try to clean up the sales tax system. And you just said if, and a lot of people think it's going to pass, and it is going to pose quality education and jobs, and that's what's out there. Right. For the general public who doesn't fully understand what you've just shared. Kind of like closing clean elections. Isn't it? Yeah, it's right. Yeah. 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 So uh, what's the strategy behind well, as you probably read, the uh, state treasurer, Doug Ducey, has um, taken up the uh, charge to, to build a campaign. There is um, more opposition to a measure like this than I've ever seen in my entire career. There's, um, I'm not sure, I don't know where in the, they, they, they purport to have business community support. I don't know what, what it is. The entire business community uh, that I'm aware of is in, is in opposition to it. So there'll be money will go towards the no campaign. It's hard to pass tax increases when there's a, when there's a no effort. Um, anybody can tell you that, whether you've got a bo local bond election or a school override. There's never been a statewide tax increase passed over funded opposition. There's been some that have passed where there's been just tepid opposition, you know, free media, that kind of thing. I'm confident that if enough money goes to the no campaign, they can get out the message uh, that what what um, well, and what there are people. I had, I, I won't tell you who it was. I had, I had a discussion with five school superintendents yesterday that came to to visit me that are just hopping mad about this. They're hopping mad about the way it's written. They're mad that they weren't counseled. They had they didn't get any opportunity to look at it. They're asking me who looked at who wrote this. And I said, well, you might go ask the proponents. But the the best school finance experts in the state. On, uh, were not in the room, or it wouldn't have been written, for instance, to ensure AHO would forever get the amount of money that they get in FY13, even if the place disappeared. So there's, I think that there's a, by the time we get to election day, I think you'll see a lot more opposition start to develop um, from a variety of different fronts. Let me give you an example. One of these concerns <coughs> in school, and tell this to your, your folks in the school, um, gosh, I wish I would have brought the chart. They, this is written for the first billion dollars to have, uh, I believe, 11 pots of money to take the first billion, and it's built to waterfall. The, the centerpiece of this is $500 million to what's called the Quality Education, Quality Education Fund. And that goes to uh, a variety of different uh, um, purposes. The last pot is $125 million to fund inflation for schools. The inflationary component, if you read it, says if there's not enough in this fund to fund inflation, go get 
the inflation out of the quality education fund at the beginning, that 500 million. They wrote this so fast, they didn't consider that the compounding nature of inflation, that once you spend that 125 million, if this passes, we will spend that for FY14, it's gone. You don't just go back and get it from the schools. We give them 125 million to fund inflation, they put it in their budgets, and then the next year it will require another inflation download. And the way that's written is take it out of the quality ed. So in five years, the centerpiece of this, the quality education fund, it's gone. The inflationary demand that's in it drains it. The schools figured out that the six years from now, they whatever benefit they got out of this is gone. Everybody at the Capitol is irritated with them for passing this measure in such a sloppy fashion, and they're left standing out in the courtyard of the Capitol wondering why they why they did that. Now, did they mean to write it that way? Maybe not. But when you're working that fast, the uh, you make mistakes. Now, they could say, well, we didn't know we don't mean for the inflationary fund to dip into it, and it, it's only to pick up the 125 goes back into the billion and picks up the marginal uh, costs. We can't do that. The Constitution says you can't run an initiative that relies on the general fund. The Arizona voters put that in the Constitution back in 2004. So it can't read any other way than the inflation money has to come out of the quality education fund. And so in six years, all of what people are being told, this permanent tax increase for quality education, it's really, it's really in its, its simplest form, it's a five-year inflation tool for schools. The quality education thing's gone and start over. I guess you'd have to go back to the ballot to fix it. But I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm confident that as word spreads that, that um, I, it has implications that I think for the universities that aren't good long term. Uh, and I think they're probably appreciating that in some circles as well. Kevin, thank you so much for your time. Well, I, I know we're taking more than the allocation. I mean, okay.